When you play D&D long enough, even magic can get a little boring. I mean, Fireball is fun the first time, but the 50th time? No, you're right, that's still fun, bad example. Magic Missile is fun the first time, but the 50th time, you might find that the excitement of spellcasting has faded. I mean, that's why I always carry a sword for when I'm bored with my spells. But this should be easy to solve, right? Just introduce some new spells, invent some, let your players invent some, or pick up one of the countless supplementary spell books for D&D. All of these were just sitting on my shelf, but until recently, I'd never used any of them. They were just expensive D&D YouTuber set decoration. Each one has hundreds of spells, and I'm sure a lot of them are cool, but who has the time to sort through them? Not me, and certainly not my players, who generally don't let a single D&D related thought sully their empty minds in between sessions. Well, I have good news. There is an easy way to use new spells to maintain mystery and excitement around spellcasting without overcomplicating things. I've made a nice YouTube-friendly numbered list of three tips, and we're gonna demonstrate these tips using a book called Vordan book of spellcraft. It has more than 250 new spells and a full system for spellcrafting, but you can apply the lessons in this video to any spellbook supplement, or even your own homebrewed spells. Vordanon's book of spellcraft was written by a dungeon master just like you thanks to today's sponsor, DMs Guild. DMs Guild is a community content program where creators can use official D&D material to create their own game content, like adventures or character options or monsters. There are thousands of PDFs all written to improve your games, and you can use my code to get a discount on any of them, not just Vordanon's Book of Spellcraft. We know that mages in the world of D&D can invent spells, because not only do we have store brand spells like Grease and Cure Wounds, but we also have certified name brand spells invented by people like Tasha and Mordenkainen and Bigby. That means it's completely reasonable to play in a world where spells exist outside of the common, easily accessible repertoire that your players have access to. In a world like that, there would be rare spells, spells lost to time, spells kept secret by their inventor. Exclusive, limited edition spells, available for a short time only, act now! Plus, there's always a possibility that some enterprising young spellcaster, even one playing at your table, could create their own spell to slap their name on at any time. I don't know about you, but I think that's really exciting, and I want to bring that into my games. So let's talk about how to do that. You're about to kick off a new campaign. You already know who your big bad will be. An ancient and powerful lich, commanding an army of undead soldiers. You know, just your typical girl boss. But your players aren't new around here. They've fought plenty of undead before, so you're gonna need more than a handful of zombies to scare them off. In fact, some of them may have even fought liches before, so they know about finger of death, power word kill, all the big guns. That's why they'll be so rattled when one of the lich's minions draws its blade across its own flesh and a dome of blood forms around them, hiding them from sight. And when the melee fighter pushes through the dome and finds themselves blinded with blood and looking like Carrie at prom, your players are going to feel excitement and fear and tension and deep regret if they didn't take prestidigitation. And Blood Shroud, which is from Vordanon's Book of Spellcraft, is just second level, so they're gonna encounter that spell again and learn to work around it. And they're gonna be on the lookout for other new spells now, too. Best of all, throughout the whole campaign, they'll have an unsettling thought in the back of their mind. If this is what the minions can do, what new horrors are waiting on the Lich's spell list? What I just described can be pulled off by spending about half an hour with a new spellbook, maybe less. Vordanon's Book of Spellcraft may have over two 250 new spells, but if I were running that Lich campaign, I'd probably ignore all but the 29 spells in the School of Necromancy. From that, I'd pick out two or three to start using immediately. As my players level up and face bigger and badder opponents, I can always return to the book for more. It's like a buffet. You don't have to get three plates right off the bat. It's not going anywhere. Leave room for dessert. And by dessert, I mean the ninth level necromancy spell Plague. Delicious. This means that you can use new magic to spice up your game without putting any additional pressure on players. They don't have to have access access to those spells if you don't want them to. Just grab whatever spells you need in order to lend novelty or flavor to your NPCs, villains, and monsters. Just like using homebrew monsters or homebrew magic items, you can pick out individual spells that feel useful to you and incorporate those into your game. Of course, this same effect can be achieved with homebrew spells of your own, too. But not all of us are confident that we could invent spells from scratch that don't break our games. I mean, who among us hasn't invented a new spell for a villain and then accidentally killed a PC in the first round of combat, right? 
Just me. If you aren't ready to be the next Leomund, you could also do the baby version of Spell Homebrew. You can rename and reflavor existing spells to give them a new look and feel and keep experienced players from recognizing them. More on that later. The possibilities for how a DM can use new spells to enhance their world are basically endless. Give your players a rival who levels up alongside them, showing up to each confrontation with the latest new spells they've discovered to keep them unpredictable. Give your world a circumstance that comes with its own magic, like the contamination in the world of Draken or invent a god and give their clerics a set of brand new spells only available to people who worship that deity. You know, the new subscription-based spellcasting model. You pay in automated monthly prayers. I really like this tactic for keeping experienced players on their toes and helping reduce the temptation to metagame. But even if your players are beginners and don't even know all the spells in the core rulebooks, new spells can also keep things exciting for you, the DM, and be great tools to help you make baddies more powerful or more flavorful. Can you tell I'm hungry? Season your villains well. It's been weeks since your cleric's deity came to them in a vision, charging them to recover a lost artifact of divine power. After digging through ancient texts, seeking the guidance of powerful NPCs, and fighting their way through trials and guardians, the relic has finally been reclaimed and returned to its rightful place at the temple. In thanks for the cleric's service, the god appears to them again and grants them a power that only the most devoted champions can wield, Wrath of the Faithful. That's the premium tier subscription. This fifth level spell fills nearby allies with a righteous fury, adding extra radiant damage to their attacks and protecting them against those who would try to sway their loyalty with magical charm. Later, the party is exploring the ruins of an ancient spellcrafter's tower. Beneath crumbling walls protected by hostile constructs and impossibly complex magical traps, they find remnants of this mage's arcane experimentation. Scrolls bearing new, untested incantations of the mage's own creation. Fiend form, maw of chaos, shadow bind. What are these spells meant to do, and will they work as intended? Will they work at all? I know I just got done making the argument to treat new spells as a DM tool rather than a player option, but why should DMs get to have all the fun? As a player, I love new spells. I got to cast some kobold press spells recently while playing a slutty tiefling nun for Doctors Without Borders, link in the cards, and it really reminded me of how much fun it is to use a spell for the first time. There is truly no joy like that of doing real-world good while simultaneously wreaking fantasy see world havoc. And to be clear, I totally understand why DMs might be hesitant to give players access to homebrew magic. Even if a player somehow wouldn't feel overwhelmed when handed a huge tome with hundreds of spells, a lot of DMs are rightfully cautious about game balance and want to be able to review and approve new additions to the game mechanics before they go into play. That's why I prefer to introduce new magic to players in small doses. I think of it much like I think of magic items. I don't just hand my players a catalog of magic items and say, here you go babe, pick out something nice. One option is to offer specific spells as part of character building or leveling up to support and emphasize your player's creative choices. If your druid's backstory is that they escaped slavery by poisoning their captors with toxic plants, the DM can be collaborative by adding Infect from Vordanans to their list of cantrips, which deals poison damage and can give the poisoned condition. And of course, the fact that D&D has a feature to enable characters to find or purchase or otherwise receive new magic in the form of a scroll makes it stupid easy to introduce a homebrew spell. For example, there's a third level spell in Bordanon's called Unearthly Choir, where creatures have to make a con save or take some damage and become deafened. Better yet, your allies can use their reaction to join in the chorus and increase the damage. Sort of like how a karaoke performance of Don't Stop Believing gets more painful for every additional drunk singer. I can think of a million fun ways to award this spell to a bard player. They run into their old music teacher who gives them a new quest. The old mentor teaches them this new spell to arm them for what's to come, one final lesson. Or maybe they join a secret bardic organization and have to complete a series of tasks to prove their loyalty. Then they receive this spell in a ceremony of initiation. Or perhaps the party is exploring some long abandoned temple and they find the spell scroll tucked away in the ruins of the choir loft, buried under centuries of dust and sheet music that sopranos never actually looked at. Yeah, that's right, I haven't been in a choir for over a decade, but altos can hold a pitch and a grudge. When a brand new spell is provided to players this way, it feels special. It's not the same as getting a new spell when you level up, or even finding a useful spell scroll to add to your spellbook. I've played enough spellcasters that even though leveling up means my characters learn new spells, I'm past the point where I, the player, learn new spells. Even at level one, I'm aware of the fact that someday my wizard will learn fireball. But if the DM gives me bone javelin, that's exciting, unexpected, and dare I say, even humorous? Sorry, I know that joke was bad. Bad to the bone! Jeez, okay, we'll move on.
But Ginny, you're probably asking, what about the true spellcrafters of the world? The players and the dungeon masters who aren't satisfied with just picking out thematically relevant or fun-sounding spells from somebody else's list? What about the people who want to invent their own magic? The dreamers who see a spell like Sickening Radiance and think, we can go harder than that. Interestingly, from what I read online, it sounds like in earlier editions of D&D, inventing new spells was an accepted part of gameplay. In first edition, before rolling a check to see if their spellcrafting succeeded, players would have to spend weeks and hundreds or even thousands of gold pieces researching their spell. And we thought D&D was an expensive hobby. In fifth edition, there are no rules for player spellcrafting, but come on, when has that ever stopped us? The way I see it, there are three options. First and easiest, you can ask the player what kind of spell they want to invent and then track down something similar from a third party publisher or another dungeon master. Other than the most fringe cases, I suspect that most spell concepts have been made before in some form. And if somebody who understands game design has already done it, why reinvent Tensor's floating disc? No, really, don't reinvent his spells. I hear that Tensor is very quick to lawyer up. Second, you can do what I affectionately call half-assed homebrew. This means taking an existing spell and either reflavoring it or or mashing it up with another spell of a similar power level. Let's take Guiding Bolt. In its original form, it's a streak of light that deals radiant damage and leaves the target glowing with light that gives the next attack against them advantage, like a magic kick me sign. Now imagine fighting a chain devil. It extends its hands and translucent magical chains covered in writhing flames leap across the battlefield, wrapping around the target and dealing 4d6 fire damage. Even as the heat fades, the shadows of the chains hang around them, leaving them vulnerable to the next attack. Even players that know Guiding Bolt are probably gonna see this spell and be like, who is she? But you didn't have to do any complicated game design to understand the spell's level and strength. This can be used infinitely to reskin spells according to your preferred flavor. It's grease, but the liquid is blood. It's flaming sphere, but it deals psychic damage. It's friends, but it just gives you a friend. Just one friend. Is that too much to ask? And finally, there's the third option whole last homebrew. For this, the player and dungeon master work together to create a spell from scratch that is mechanically balanced for gameplay. This is, without a doubt, the most difficult option. Unless both player and dungeon master are experienced with game design, there is a high likelihood that this spell will end up broken in some way that neither creator anticipated. But lots of difficult things get easier when we have resources, and spellcrafting is no exception. Wardanon's Book of Spellcraft has a detailed breakdown of all the elements that need to be considered when creating a spell. First, there's an explanation of each element, sort of a spell designer primer. For example, when discussing casting time, the book explains that reaction spells are rare and often powerful, and that spells with long casting times are usually utility spells, such as wards or divination, and more likely to be able to be cast as rituals. Then each element of a spell is assigned a difficulty. These numbers are added up to generate a DC that the spellcrafter must meet in order to successfully invent the spell. So a casting time of one minute or longer, for instance, is a plus zero modifier, while making a spell into a reaction spell will add two to the DC. DC, since those spells are more powerful and rare, and thus harder to create. Full disclosure, I think these rules are a little incomplete. First of all, I don't love the idea of spellcrafting being reduced to a single role. I mean, even copying an existing spell into a wizard spellbook costs 50 gold pieces and two hours per spell level, so I don't think it makes sense to be able to invent a whole ass spell with a single arcana role for free. If I were to incorporate this into my own game, I'd be inventing my own ways to make this feel like more of a project. It would probably be tied to a quest, and there would be some process of research and experimentation with consequences for failure, and there would certainly be a cost. Most likely, I would require multiple successful checks over the course of several days or weeks in order to succeed at spell invention. And I'd give you advantage on the roll if the name of your spell included a pun, because my game, my rules. The tables for calculating the DC for spell creation also seem unreliable to me. I tried making up a few spells to see what their DCs would be, and while some made sense, others felt too low for a craft that supposedly only master mages can perform. So while I do think the spellcrafting section of Vordanon's contains some really useful information, I don't think it can stand alone. I would use the information from this chapter as a baseline, but be sure to also do some common sense comparisons with existing spells to check your work. Or just tell your players that any spell they invent is fair game for the villains to use too. I'm guessing that'll make them a little more conscientious.
Now, Vordanon's Book of Spellcraft has some great spells, and it's under 10 bucks, so if you're considering introducing third-party spells into your games, I think it's a great starter book. You can find the link in the description, and don't forget to use my code for a discount. If you have any other DM Skilled products on your wish list, this would be a good time to throw them into your cart and save a few extra dollars. But there are tons of third-party spellbooks out there, so if you're looking for something bigger, or something available in print, or something with a theme, I'd encourage you to shop around and find the right spellbook for your game. For example, if you really want to bring in more divine magic, you might like the book that I featured a few months ago in my video, Let D&D Players Fight Gods. It offers DMs tools, like spells and godly aspects, in case they want to spice up their games with more divine flavor. God, I'm so hungry. I gotta go get some lunch. <laughs>